little bit. So, and I've got three minutes after. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Sounds great. Hello, everybody. I'm Marty Rosendale, CEO of the Maryland Tech Council, and this is the Business Continuity Task Force Executive Insight Series. The Business Continuity Task Force was formed during the pandemic with executive mentors from our venture mentoring service to assist company executives that had been facing the pandemic recession. The Business Continuity Task Force since then has, has pivoted a little bit. Today, we are helping companies um, emerge from the pandemic. We're helping them deal with some of the challenges that were created by the pandemic, but also challenges related to inflation, supply chain issues, and, and other challenges that our companies are seeing. The Maryland Tech Council is the industry trade association representing the technology and life science industries throughout Maryland. Together with our members, we're improving the business climate in Maryland and helping companies that save, secure, and improve lives around the globe. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping this morning. Uh, right now, your, your microphones are muted. And uh, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please use the chat or Q&A functions. You'll find those icons at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will be monitoring that throughout the, the conversation and the presentation this morning. So, so feel free to use those functions um, as we go on. Uh, this Zoomcast is being recorded and it will be made available for others to, to watch or listen to. Uh, later on. So again, thank you all for joining us. My guest today is Andrew Woods. Andrew is the founder and CEO of DuckPen, a Baltimore-based web design and marketing agency. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning. So our topic today is digital communication strategy. And Andrew, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate the, the time out of your schedule this morning. And um, I just want to make a point, let people know before we get started, that DuckPin um, and, the, and your, your talented team um, worked with our creative talent, Angela, to, to, to build the um, Dream Jobs platform on the Biohub Maryland website. You guys did an amazing job, and I want to let everybody here know that um, if, you, if you want to learn more about DuckPin, you can go to their, web, their website, which is rollwithduckpin.com. If you want to see the amazing work that they did for the Maryland Tech Council, you go to biohubmaryland.com and look under careers. You'll find the Dream Jobs um, platform there. So, so Andrew, uh, in order to get started, um, just take a minute. Tell us about yourself, about your background. How did you get to this point in your life and, and your career? And, and what are you passionate about? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, as Marty said, I'm Andrew Woods. I'm CEO of DuckPin. Um, but before that, before uh, I guess my professional identity, I am a person outside of work. Uh, I have uh, a wife, Christina, of 10 years. We have two boys. Um, one who turned five yesterday and the other one who turned seven on Tuesday. So we've had an uh, exciting birthday week at the Woods household, lots of cake. Um, I am passionate about travel and backpacking and sailing and pretty much anything outdoors. Um, I'm really big into tech, but I'm also really big into getting away from tech. Um, and I, I love to build things. And uh, I think that's where digital things, physical things, I think that's where um, my, my personal life sort of blends in with my professional life. Um, I uh, Professionally, I, I went to school for visual communication design. Um, I started my career as a designer, I was a packaging designer at a local packaging design firm. We specialized in that. Um, that was very cool. When it comes to building, uh, I, I got to see the tangible effects of my work. I could walk into a Walmart or a grocery store or a Home Depot or Lowe's and, and see my packaging and my merchandising on the shelves, which was, um, you know, that that is like a builder's dream, you know, seeing it come to fruition, uh, seeing it in that tangible form. Um, but as time went on, uh, I, I really missed a lot of the, the tech things I was doing just for fun as a team um, in that professional sense. Um, and that's really where DuckPen came about. It was that uh, drive and vision for jumping, you know, back into a digital space, um, jumping into the web space, marketing space. And uh, we've built that up over the years. Um, we started as a, a consumer experience design company at DuckPen, um, me and my two co-founders, Chad Bierenbaum, Cara Bonadio. Uh, Started very much design focused, just based on all of our backgrounds as designers. But over time, we dropped design from our name. We're just duckpin now. 
Um, and we, we have uh, heavily moved into the web and marketing space. That's, that's interesting. So, so Andrew, I share your, your passion for building things. Before I was a microbiologist, I was a tool design engineer. And uh, I used to enjoy I, you know, traveling around and seeing the results of my work, um, which was, was, was always kind of neat. It, it's um, great. So um, Duckpin is an interesting name. Why, why Duckpin? Yeah, so um, I, if you're not familiar with Duckpin Bowling, hopefully you are uh, in the area. Duckpin is uh, a type of bowling that was created here in Baltimore in the 20s. Um, so obviously it's a very Baltimore thing. Um, but beyond that, uh, I, I mentioned I have, I have two partners in this business, Chad and Kara. Um, we were thinking of, you know, something very Baltimore centric. We're proud of, of, uh, of Baltimore and, and operating and headquartered here. Um, but also one very unique thing about Duckman Bowling is that you get three rolls with the ball uh, per frame instead of 10 pin bowling, which is m most people are, you know, familiar with. You get two rolls. Um, and we just thought that was kind of neat. You know, this concept of, you know, you, you've got three, uh, three shots at, and knocking down all the pins. And we saw that as sort of our three perspectives. And a, and a funny story, um, we were kicking around this idea and uh, the domain name we wanted, which of it was available, which is obviously always a big thing when it comes to naming your company, uh, it's like, is, is it available? Uh, <laughs> um, but so it, it all seemed like it was headed in the right direction. And then uh, Chad and Kara were actually out for a, a run. Um, in, in the area and they saw a single bowling pin on the side of the road with a, a note on it that said take me and they called me and they said this has to be a sign this is the what's the chances that a bowling pin is sitting on the side of the road as someone's trash um so that was it it was history from then and that bowling pin is in our conference room today so uh just kind of a, a reminder of our roots there that's a, that's a great story so andrew i know you prepared some slides um, why don't you take you know, 20, 25 minutes and, and go through the slides for us? Yeah, absolutely. Let me uh, get my screen set up here. And hopefully, oh, screen sharing has failed to start. Let's try this one. Well, we can, we can see your screen. All right, great. Um, we don't, we don't see the slides, Andrew, just, just oh. your, your screen. There we go. All right, let me go full screen with this. All right, we all set? Yes. Outstanding. Um, so yeah, I wanna, I wanna talk to you about marketing, digital communications, digital strategy. Um, whatever you might want to call it, uh, you know, I, I guess the big distinction here is we're talking about marketing, not necessarily sales. Um, and that's a big part of what we do here at Duckpin in a, a variety of ways. And um, Marty, when I was speaking with you about, you know, who would be in attendance today, it, it seemed like there, you know, there'd be a wide range of folks. So I wanted to keep it pretty, um, pretty general, not too uh, specific to any company size or industry or anything of that nature, really keep it, uh, um, you know, general in a sense that everyone could take something away from this. Um, when I have conversations with, with prospects at Duckpin, uh, the conversation starts like this very frequently. You know, I, I need a website or uh, I need you to set up my Salesforce CRM or I need you to do this or I need you to do that. And, um, you know, I, me being somebody who loves, you know, tangible things, uh, got reactions like, yeah, you know, we can do that. Um, but at the same time, uh, when the conversations start there, I, I do generally tend to say, you know, hold on, let's hit the brakes here. Um, because starting there is usually not a good place to achieve marketing results. Um, it's obviously a, a very important part to achieving marketing results, but um, when it comes to marketing, uh, to us, it, it's definitely uh, in, in this order, psychology and then channels and tactics and then technology. Um, and the reason for that being is on the psychology side, um, it's all about them, them being who it is you're, you're attempting to speak to. Um, it's about understanding your audience. And and, and, Andrew, I'm going to interrupt you for just a second. I don't think your slides are forwarding. We're still seeing the marketing slide. Oh, no. 
Let me see if I can switch to. Okay, now, now we see the slide with understand your audience. Well, I don't know why it's not working in full screen. If you guys are okay with just leaving it at, uh, with the toolbar, I'll go with that. Okay. So anyhow, um, again, you know, for us, it, we like to think of it in this order, psychology, channels and tactics and technology um, in that order. And, and the reason being psychology is about them, your audience, it's about them. What do they, what do they need to hear? And then moving into how do you deliver it and what tools do you use? Um, so starting on the psychology side of things, um, I, I always like to ask, you know, what's going on? What's going on in the life of the audiences that you want to speak to? Um, and generally in marketing, there's multiple audiences. I've rarely worked with uh, any company that really has a single audience. There's usually a single very obvious audience, but there's generally several other uh, outside audiences that are worth communicating with in some form or fashion. Um, but for the purpose of demonstration, just kind of talk through, you know, how, how we think about this. Um, it, a lot of times this can start with a gut reaction. Other people might want to do more in-depth uh, formal research or surveys, focus groups, things of that nature. But what we're trying to find here at the, the psychology stage of, uh, of marketing is, is what's going on in the life of your, your prospect. Um, so just as a B2C example, you know, say we had Baltimore Bike Company, um, they're, they want to sell bikes. Um, who do they need to speak to? Obvious audiences are people who bike and people who might want to bike. Um, and, you know, what's going on in those people's lives? Uh, it, it's a huge range. Um, you know, it could range from very general things like what activities can I do with my family? I need to lose weight. Um, I, you know, it's maybe emotional things like my, my biking friends are making fun of my old bike and it, you know, brings me down. Um, or, you know, maybe they're already a biker and they, you know, they're, they're trying to find the right bike. What style of bike? What's the lightest bike? How much do these things cost? Or maybe, uh, maybe they just bought a bike that was super expensive. You know, how do I make sure this thing stays maintained or I wrecked it, you know, and, uh, I need parts for it. And, for those of you that have been doing marketing or, or you know, work in this space, this, this may look familiar. You may have seen it in a funnel format uh, or a linear format like this, but it's various stages in the, the life cycle of these, um, of these people. Um, you know, there's an awareness stage uh, in this example. What fun activities can I do with the family? Not even talking about biking. Biking is a potential solution all the way down to, you know, I've already bought a bike and I crashed it. Um, where, where do I get parts? And, and making sure that you provide a, a loyal experience to that person so that they know they can come back and buy parts from you. Um, and this translates just fine to, to B2B. Uh, I'm using an example here of a, a law firm that might be looking for marketing services from a company like Duckpin. Um, and, and there's, there's a, a range here as well, you know, here's a law firm owner and, and that, you know, recognition is important to them. That's something they, they hold uh, dear in their, their, you know, efforts to get up every day and do what they do. Um, it's not just a living, the recognition is an important part to them, or I'm exhausted, you know, I started this firm and it's burning me out. Or, you know, it's more tangible things. How can I get more leads? Why is my competitor doing better? Uh, how can I find a company to help me with this? How much is that going to cost? Um, or, you know, in the act of an engagement, you know, these leads aren't the greatest quality. How can we improve this? Or how can we make this scale so I can make more uh, or grow bigger? Um, and it's the same thing. You know, it's this sort of life cycle. And, and again, this, is, this has been shown in, in marketing education. I did not invent this. Um, but it, it's, it's important. It's important to understand that there's people behind all of these decisions, behind all of these needs. Um, and they're in various stages of, of, their, uh, of their needs and of their uh, awareness. And um, that's, that's where we want to start. So when we talk to, uh, to companies about doing marketing, um, we, you know, it's all about thinking human. This is, this is where we want to start the conversation rather than, you know, what uh, what delivery methods or, or tools we're going to use to do it. And again, I, I don't want to downplay the importance of those things. Now that say you've gone through exercises to find what those is, what that what those things are, what the messages need to be to speak to uh, the humans behind your goals. 
you can move into channels and tactics, um, which is, is really a blend of uh, about them and about you. So channels and tactics give you sort of a, a, a highway to uh, deliver your message to them. And, and in the same sense, it's the highway that delivers the message to them. They, they're the recipient. So um, this is this is the uh, conduit of your message. Um, it's all about being in the right place at the right time um, is, is what channels and tactics are about. And uh, I'll be honest, you know, here is just what I would say a small list of available channels and tactics in the marketing space. And this is an intentionally uh, overwhelming slide. We're not going to go through all of these. And there's hundreds more behind it. Um, and that's kind of like where marketing gets complicated uh, is, is, you know, especially if you start here, you know, if you're starting your marketing here and you're like, oh, what should I do? Should I do display ads and content curation and uh, offer a tool? Um, if you start here, you, you're, you're just throwing darts. You're going to have a, a very difficult time picking, you know, what should you do to speak to your audience? Had you started with, you know, what, it, what exactly are some needs? Pick some specific needs from my, uh, my audience, um, it should be easier to pick what you should do or what you can do. There's going to be lots of things you can do and you probably can't do all of them. Just jumping back to our examples, Baltimore Bike Company, um, picking a specific need. What fun activities can I do with my family? Um, and how might I inject biking as a possible solution into that question, into that need? Um, this is just one example, one of tons of possibilities to inject uh, yourself into um, this question. This particular example would be to use something like Harrow. If you've never heard of Harrow, help a reporter out. There's lots of different versions of it out there um, where you can contribute to existing um, journalists' articles based on topic. Um, so say you were to find a journalist that writes articles about, uh, about family, or in this case, you know, ways to keep your family safe and sane during COVID-19, um, you could contribute to that article and provide something of value to the readers there. And what you win here is you're, you're leveraging their existing audience. Um, you don't need to go drum up 20,000 readers. They already exist. They're already interested in what this journalist has to offer. Um, you can appeal to the concerned parent who's reading it. Um, this is something safe. This is something fun. It's family friendly um, and, and provide that information as an authority. It can be timely. Um, you know, COVID-19, big topic uh, around this task force is, uh, you know, uh, people's psychology has changed. You know, uh, how people spend their time has changed. Um, so this is an opportunity to say, hey, you know, biking is a great opportunity in this very moment. You know, your, your, your family struggles that you're having right now not just in general, right now that we can address with this. You can earn a backlink to your website and you're not selling anything, you're being helpful. That's really what marketing is all about. Uh, tapping back into that you know, human nature of marketing. How can I help these people? Um, same thing on the, uh, on the B2B side, you know, if we were to jump down the funnel, so to speak, um, Picking some, a, a conversion act, you know, what, what companies deliver the best law firm results? That might be something that is concerning a law firm owner. You know, how can I make sure that the person who's, who's saying they're going to provide these services that are going to help me grow my firm and take stuff off my plate, how can I confirm that they're legitimate and that they're, uh, you know, not some fly-by-night company? Um, and, you know, a company like DuckPen could leverage their Google My Business page, just one of many, many tactics that you can use to build your legitimacy online. Um, show where you are, that they're real people that work for you. Show real work. Um, get reviews from existing customers. Provide accurate information through this channel. Uh, on top of that, you could, by doing so, show up higher in search results, which is just an added benefit. Um, but just, again, you know, thinking of, you know, what what does this person need to hear? What does this law firm owner need to hear to comfort them in knowing that they're picking the right firm to help them grow? Um, and there are, there are lots of channels and tactics to do that, and none of them are wrong. Um, but by knowing what it is they need and what they need to hear, it makes the selection 
from this list a much, much e easier process. Um, you know, so, so again, channels and tactics are all about meeting these people in the moment. It's a very human selection of channels and tactics to meet them in that very moment. Um, and the, the channels and tactics will vary depending on what moment they are in, you know, where they are in that funnel, so to speak. And last, uh, but I don't want to say, but not least, but technology, um, technology is a tool. And it is a tool for you, and it provides leverage to your efforts. And it, um, it, it is very important, but it is not about them. It is about you and how you manage your efforts. And it's important to recognize that because a lot of people I speak with about marketing want to start here. Um, and this is why that's dangerous. Uh, you thought the, the channels and tactics slide was overwhelming. Here is a four-year-old uh, infographic not ours, can't take claim to this, uh, Marketing Technology Media LLC, but four years old, so it's bigger than this now, of what is going on in the marketing technology space. Uh, all of those tiny little dots of color are logos of companies that represent a sliver of that industry. Um, there is so much to choose from. I don't know how anyone would ever really uh, hone in on one without say, following the psychology, then channels and tactics, then technology flow. Um, and technology can do a lot of things for you in the marketing space. Uh, this is, again, a small list of things that it can help you do. And I underlined can and help you because it can also uh, do the opposite. It can not help you. It can waste uh, time and money. Um, it can distract you, but it can also help you do really amazing things on the research side. It can help you define audiences and discover gaps and do competitor analysis, manage your workflow, um, automate things, find talent vendors and collaborate. And when you're delivering on your marketing uh, from an execution level, it can help you create content, distribute and organize content. Um, you can personalize it, uh, AI and machine learning coming into that space. You can test it, live interaction with your, with your customers uh, through technology, provide you access to ad networks and other things that you just, you really couldn't do without technology. Um, and down to refining, uh, you know, marketing is very cyclical, uh, dis discovering what worked and what didn't and making sure that that feedback loop finds its way back into your execution. So you're doing better next time, every time. You're choosing better channels and tactics. Um, you're, you're refining your messaging so it hits better. Um, th these are all things that technology can help you do. And I, I, I touched on this you know, briefly there, um, but you, you need to watch out for shiny object syndrome. Again, if you're, if you're coming into marketing and thinking, what, what tech can I use to sell my product? You're thinking about it all wrong. Um, that is shiny object syndrome. You're, you're, you're thinking about these technologies and all these great things that they're selling you. Um, and, and it's going to be a distraction to what you really need to do, which is understand your customer and to find a message for them that's very timely. Um, meet them in the moment. Uh, you could waste money. Um, these things are not cheap. And they, you can have hundreds of them. It, it can get out of control very quickly. And the more you add, the more complicated they get. And then you're bringing in, you know, say, uh, agencies or consultants to help you use them or, or, or tweak them. Um, can get very expensive. And uh, for a smaller business, that's not a good thing. You know, you, you've got limited resources. Use them wisely. In the same sense, wasted time. You're distracted by it. Um, is there something better you could be using your time with? And they love to lock you in. Everything does these days. Everything is a SaaS model, and there there are great benefits to that. But um, just be careful. You know, you're choosing a technology, and if you get locked in for a year, or even worse, you've used it for a year, and your data is in there, and you, they don't provide an easy way for you to get out, which is uh, sort of a tactic in the technology space at times, um, you could really find yourself in, in some trouble in terms of, you know, uh, I've got myself dug in here and it's difficult to get out. Um, but it's not all bad. I don't want to make it sound like technology is doom and gloom. It's very powerful. Um, I offer these, these sort of warnings and tips. Um, ask yourself some pretty important questions when you, you come to a technology. Uh, does it save you time? Does it save money? Does it open doors? Um, does it help you give to your audience? 
can it keep it simple? Um, you know, I, I, I want to touch on that one. You know, you see a lot of like small companies, they, they see like the, the market leader in the technology and they want it, they're drawn right to that. Um, and, and that might not be the best fit, you know, sometimes those things are so feature rich that it's not even a, an appropriate solution for where you are in your business. Um, does it help you understand, understand what you're doing, your customer, does it prove success or does it help you understand success? Um, a couple tools online that I like to use when, when we evaluate new technologies or we recommend others to, um, G2 Crowd and Captera are, are both, um, they're technology review platforms. Uh, they, they're always with verified users of the tool. And um, both of them have the ability to drill down into your company size and your market, um, which I think is, is very appropriate when it comes to selecting technology. You know, Are there other people in your market that are seeing success with this that find it valuable? And is it an appropriate fit for the size of your business? You know. Um, is there an alternative that might be better for small business that that actually has less features, costs less, and is easier to jump into and self-manage? You don't need to go hire a consultant to help you uh, work through it. And uh, my general rule of thumb when it comes to technology is when in doubt, just assume it's overkill. Don't try to solve a problem with technology that doesn't even exist yet. You know, wait wait until you hit that roadblock. Marketing is, is all about roadblocks. You, you hit these roadblocks and you might find that technology can get you over the hump. Um, but we see often that, that technology is selected before that hump is even found. Um, and, and it, you know, it reverts back to this. So with all of that being said, you know, don't lose sight of what's really important in marketing. Um, marketing is about people. Uh, when you go to make a, a plan, a strategy, it should always, always, always be surrounding what, you know, what your audiences need and what's going on in their lives. And that should be reassessed frequently. I like to use COVID as an example. Um, these are not like changes in people's uh, psychology or, or uh, circumstances over decades. Um, when, we, when we entered COVID, this was a massive disruption to what was going on in the lives of our audiences, pretty much every industry um, in a matter of weeks. And that went on for years. And here we are, you know, sort of digging our way out and we're, we're seeing things open back up and in-person meetings. And, and that's going to change the people you're speaking to and your messaging should change um, based on the fact that things are changing now. And um, I don't know what it's going to be like six months from now or a year from now. Um, I shouldn't even speculate, but I should reconsider how I communicate with all of, all of my potential customers. Um, I just reevaluate that frequently and, and put that up against the channels, tactics, technology, and tools that I'm using so that my message is always right. I'm always marketing in the moment and I'm always being efficient. And um, again, you know, nothing too uh, specific or tactical there, but I really, I really wanted that to be the takeaway here is, is just uh, you know, how, how important the human aspect of this is. Andrew, thank you for that. You, you covered a tremendous amount of ground there. Um, <clears throat> so you know, as, I, as I think about what you just went through, and, I, and then I think back two years ago when we first went into lockdown from the pandemic, it seems like it was a frantic search for technology. And then we started looking again at the, the human aspect, right? First, we, it was a frantic search for what's the best technology that's going to allow us to engage with our customers remotely. And then it became now, how do we do that effectively and, and, and meet them where they are? But what, what did you see in those early days of the pandemic? That's exactly what we saw. Um, and, and a lot of, you know, what I say when it comes to where the conversation started, it, it was always, you know, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hang tight. You know, what, let's talk about your customer. What um, are they not in the office anymore? Uh, are they, you know, maybe you sell a product and they're not allowed to, to, you know, get their hands on it, touch it anymore. Let's understand what's, what's going on right now. Um, before we go uh, again, jumping at the shiny object, because there's so much available to us and, and it's all very powerful, but if, if we don't really understand what it is they need, um, we don't really, we can't really make an informed decision about what the solution is. And what I saw was a, a lot of folks jumping on technologies, getting locked in and thinking, 
oh man, you know, this, this might not have been the best choice, or uh, I wish I had invested my time and money elsewhere, sort of frustrated by, by what they chose. And it almost turned one problem into two. Um, you know, you had this problem that was just entirely inevitable. COVID came in and it messed up everybody's life. Um, and it was an enormous problem. But by just throwing a solution at it, uh, you've now just introduced an, an additional headache to your life. Um, and that's not to say that some people didn't, uh, didn't guess right and, <laughs> and get something that solved the problem right away. And for them, you know, great. But I, I definitely think there, there, could be a, there could have been more strategic thought with, with a lot of folks that could have saved them a lot of headaches, and hassle, wasted money and time um, to, to solve these problems in a way that resonated with their customers. Yeah. So um, I want to I want to talk a little bit about uh, measuring the success uh, of the of these marketing uh, marketing programs and, and these technologies. I'm a, I'm an old sales executive. And I remember you know back earlier in my career, it, sales has always been easy to track. Right, sales is tactical. You get out there, you make it, you, you you make a sale, you record it. It's easy to track. Marketing was always a challenge to to track the the success of marketing. But with digital platforms, it seems to me that that's changed a bit. That, with, that we can we can at least track the activity better and the reception better. I'm not sure we can always track it all the way through to a sale, though. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, I, I like to say, you know, ROI is the holy grail of marketing KPIs, um, but it is also the most difficult thing to achieve from a marketer's marketer's perspective. There are, there are some uh, instances where it's, it's not as difficult. Um, I, I'll use like e-commerce and uh, paid advertising as an example. Have a very good idea through you know, existing tracking technologies. Google Analytics would be a you know, very common one. Um, using Google Ads, click, viewed three pages, bought product. You have a very good idea of what you spent, what you got out of it. You can even track that particular customer over time to see the lifetime value um, through, say, an e-commerce platform like Magento or Shopify. Um, but that gets really blurry when you get into um, marketing channels that aren't so impulsive. Uh, and, and I would say um, the pursuit of ROI KPIs can sometimes distract from marketing initiatives. And I, I know that's challenging to hear for, especially like my customers, um, to hear like, hey, you know, I don't wanna put more effort into uh, tracking than I do into speaking to your customer. Uh, because at the end of the day, we have limited resources. You know, you might have a limited budget working with us and I wanna put the most amount of that effort into connecting with your customer. And what that might not mean is uh, you might not wanna allocate funds to listening to say every phone call through a call, call recording platform like CallRail. It's something we can do. Um, we can track phone calls, we can determine the outcome, we can assign that to, uh, to a customer in a CRM and track lifetime value through the CRM, watch their purchases through maybe a patient management system or a legal case management system. Um, those are all things we can do, but they're, they're time intensive. Um, so for smaller companies, I would say try not to beat yourself up so much on the ROI KPI. Maybe uh, seeing Activity KPIs is, is just as good so that you're allocating more resources to the activity um, and, and keep that in tune with an understanding of how sales are. So you might not be able to directly correlate it. Now, if you're an enormous organization and you have all the resources in the world to put against uh, setting up you know, complex attribution models, um, go for it. Get all the technology in the world. Listen to every phone call. Track every click. Watch every scroll. Um, you know, understand literally every single transactional moment in the history of of every person who's connected with you digitally or otherwise. Um, but it's just uh, it, it's important to balance those things. Mm -hmm. So. You, you put up a couple of slides that were meant to be impactful, right? The, the channels as well as the, the technologies. And, and, and you talked about the complexity of those, of, of those two things. What, what advice specifically would you give a company right now as we're, as we're emerging from the pandemic? How, how should they be approaching this? 
Uh, I, I think if I were to revert back to saying, you know, don't don't try to sol solve a problem that doesn't exist. Um, it, it, it's okay to have a, a roadblock in marketing. Um, it's 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 expected. So um, wait until you find yourself saying, well, I, I feel limited in this capacity. I you know I, I feel like I can't reach this particular audience because of this or. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I can't scale this because of this, or I can't manage this because of this, hit the roadblock and then solve the problem. Um, I, that would be my biggest recommendation. You know, just don't, don't run to technology for technology's sake. Run to technology to solve a, a real issue that you're currently experiencing. Um, and you'll hit them quickly. Uh, you know, lots of companies are, are immediately going to adopt, it, at least even in the small business side, you know, ways to build an email newsletter and reach out to people through that. And, uh, but, you know, your solution doesn't need to be run to Salesforce and uh, link up with Pardot. Maybe you start with MailChimp and it's, you know, it's month to month, you're not locked in, you can export your data, you can segment customers. Wow, you've just unlocked so much power in the form of uh, the email channel. And you're not locked in, you're, you know, and, and I'm not necessarily sitting here endorsing MailChimp, I'm just using it as an example. Um, and, and maybe one day you'll find that MailChimp has limitations that uh, you're, you're not able to store enough customer data or you're not able to do enough automation that you had hoped. And it's time to start researching um, how you can solve that problem. It's a new problem, it requires a new technology, it requires a new solution. Um, I, I think that really applies across the board. It's just, Wait until you have the problem to solve it. Don't solve problems that don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, so first, uh, I'm going to take a second and remind all of the uh, attendees this morning that if you have a question or you want to make a comment, please use the Q&A function or the chat function that should be at the bottom of your screen. And, and Andrew, um, this might be a quick question, but are, are all marketing agencies today digital communications agencies as well? Um, most are now I would say there are some out there that have, uh, uh, you know, particular niches, um, you know, that might be in printed media or in, you know, really obscure things like, uh, we, you know, we specialize in, um, you know, restaurant marketing and we're all about menus and working with Yelp and things like that. Um, but for the most part, um, I, I would say most marketing companies are in the digital sphere now. It's it's where people find information. I mean, this is, if, if you're not, you're almost, uh, you're missing 95% of the information uh, channels that exist. So yeah, I, th I think most marketing companies are in digital communications and, and there's varying flavors of that. There's marketing companies that oppose themselves very much as, you know, data driven, data refined, data, data, data. There's other marketing companies that are saying, you know, consumer experience and storytelling and everything kind of in between, um, which is great because different customers have different needs and approaches and leadership. And um, I don't think any one of those in particular is, is right or wrong. Uh, I think the, the variety is what makes us all uh, have our own selling point. So, so is there a place for traditional print channels today? Yeah, I'll never let print go. Uh, I know a lot of people say, <laughs> I know a lot of people say print is dead. Um, I do disagree. There's obviously, you know, sort of this, this idea that, um, you know, all of this, all of this, all of these mailers just go in the trash and, and most of them do. Um, but, you know, again, that is one of those things where it's, it's a get, get back to your audience. Um, we have a customer in, uh, has a e-commerce and a few retail stores. Um, they cater to an older audience and they absolutely kill it with their printed catalog every holiday season. I mean, it is the biggest driver of their revenue every year. Um, and so, you know, it, it depends is, is the unfortunate answer in marketing is it depends. Um, picking the right channel for your audience is, is important. So, you know, is a, uh, is a 22 year old uh, looking for a cryptocurrency platform going to respond well to 
to a mailer? You know, probably not. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's all you know, it's all considering context, the human aspect of this. Yeah, it's interesting. I know um, for, for my hobbies, I, I I like to receive the printed catalogs. I don't know why I like that because I just put them on a shelf, and then when I need to order something, I look online. I never open the catalog. <laughs> But, uh, but for some reason, I like having it on my shelf. Maybe it uh, maybe it's just a reminder, in which case it's effective marketing. <laughs> so um, as we as we went into the pandemic and you think about your client base, what are the attributes of your clients, the, the most successful clients? What were the attributes that made them successful? I mean, that, that was a pretty massive pivot that we all had to make. And, and what were the attributes of those companies that made them more successful? That is a, is a great question. I, I would say the most successful clients didn't just adapt. I would say they actually leveraged COVID's changes. Um, and for some, that was easier than others. Uh, I use an example of um, uh, outdoor sports client we have. Um, that was the entire concept of, you know, everybody's home now and there's lots more family activity and outdoors is safe. Um, it could have just been like, oh, great, you know, uptake in sales. But instead it was like, all of our marketing needs to talk about the value of this in the era of COVID now. Um, so it wasn't just adapting. It wasn't just like, you know, we'll just take the win because we got it. It was, you know, we're going to multiply this. We're going to leverage the change in our customers' lives to actually uh, increase our size. And then I guess on the other end of the spectrum, you know, not so much a windfall, um, have a, a fitness client um, who did have to adapt, you know, did in-person uh, training at their, at their studio and boom, closed, you know, can't, can't take customers. And, and for a lot of people, it would have just been like, okay, I'm dead, that's it. Um, but for him, it was, okay, you know, I need to immediately start working on some online programs. And that customer now only provides virtual training and online programs. Their business has grown considerably. Um, and it, it was a opportunity that went from disaster to multiplier in a matter of six months. Um, so I, I would say, you know, that's the attribute. You know, if, you, if you can take something that is uh, just a punch in the stomach and turn it around and leverage it to multiply your, your wins, that, that is success. Um, you know, that is impressive and uh, not everybody can do it. It's really outstanding. <clears throat> so, so as we think about that, now we're coming out of the pandemic, but unfortunately, as we're coming out of the pandemic, we're getting, we're getting hit with inflation, we're getting hit with supply chain challenges. The challenges are never ending. What, the same question, what do you anticipate to be the characteristics of the companies that will successfully emerge from the pandemic? I, and I, you know, I, uh, I hate to sort of use the same answer, but um, in that sense, you know, supply chain issues, is there a way to increase your sales by notifying your client base, hey, we know that supply chain issues are, are happening. We want to make sure that, you know, coming up to the holidays or coming up to conference season or coming up to whatever it may be that's going on in your industry, you're prepared. Here's things we can get for you um, and be proactive about that communication. Not only are you being helpful in that you're giving them a heads up uh, that there, you know, could be challenges. You're you're protecting yourself and saying like, hey, look, don't blame me when you wait to the last minute and and there's supply chain issues. But by being proactive, you're actually marketing your your offerings. You're saying like, hey, order this stuff because uh, you know if you wait three weeks, um, you might not have it. So sort of using urgency marketing in that sense, um, just one example of how you can, rather than just sit there and be frustrated about the challenges that supply chain issues are going to, to cause your business, you can actually leverage those issues as a marketing uh, tactic. So kind of, you know, keeping on this path of looking to the future, um, 
you know, a few minutes ago, you said you probably shouldn't predict what the future looks like, but I'm going to ask you to anyway. So if you take out your crystal ball and you think about where this is all headed, what, what do you see? What does the future look like in digital communications to you? That is a, is a very good question. Um, I, I want to be as optimistic as possible this year, um, despite last year really crushing my optimism from January to December. Um, I, I want to believe that we're going to see um, not just marketing, but everything head back in a pre-COVID direction. Um, at, you know, in-person meetings, in-person conferences, being able to, to leverage uh, events and personal networking as part of your marketing strategy. And I would say, you know, on the B2B side, that's been probably the biggest challenge is, you know, what, what tactics are you using to build sort of uh, do, do relationship building that has been um, just decimated by not being able to be in person with others. I, I I am already seeing a pretty substantial uptick in all of that activity. Um, for me, for my customers, um, it appears to be translating into comfort levels of spending, into comfort levels of, um, in, into growth of sales. And uh, I, I really, I just want to commit to believing that we're on the end of this. And by the end of the year, we can say, hey, you know, the, the vast majority of that pain is behind us and 2023 will feel normal again. Um, and I'm not always an optimist, but I will be here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm not gonna ask you what normal looks like because I know that's, that, that's a, a tough one to, to answer at this point. Um, Andrew, we've got about 10 minutes left. I wanna give the audience a chance to ask questions. I wanna remind everybody, if you have a question or a comment, to please use the chat or the, or the Q&A function. And, um, and before we go there, Andrew, just uh, a question to you. Is there, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure you communicate to the audience today? No, I think we, we covered everything. Um, again, you know, think human. That's, that's the takeaway here. Just be human in your marketing. Give, give to get. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you, will, you will succeed with that methodology, um, with that with that mindset. It, it may take time, but you will win that way. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it, it's been interesting, and I'm going to take the prerogative of being the monitor to uh, the, the moderator to uh, ask the first question, but um, as, as we've begin to come out of the pandemic, we're finding at the Tech Council at our events that the combination of both in-person and, and virtual or live streaming is the most powerful combination because we can get a few hundred people that want to attend an, an in-person event and hundreds of people that live stream it at the same time. So it dramatically increases the audience that, that we're able to get to. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, it got me thinking about what, what does that future look like? It certainly changed the way that we're doing things today. Um, and, and, and I'm thinking about things like the metaverse, right? We've, so we've got, we've got member companies that are buying real estate in the metaverse. And so there's going to be you know, the, the, the concept of digital advertising in the metaverse on top of everything else. Um, are, are you starting to see some of that pop up today? A little bit. Um, there's conversation around it. I, I would say at this point, I'm at a level of uh, curiosity. Um, and, and that's about it. Uh, I, Duck Pin as, as a company, um, we position ourselves, I, I would say, a step down from trying to be on the bleeding edge of everything. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I don't see that as, as a negative thing. Um, I see that as uh, a, allowing, um, allowing others to be the, the uh, <laughs> test dummies, if you will. Um, and, and seeing how things shake out. And I don't think on the metaverse side of things, things have really shaken out. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I want to be respectful of my clients' time and money um, and not push them in a direction that, you know, going back to shiny object syndrome may or may not be. Um, so I've remained 
cautious about those things. And uh, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, you know, I'm a tech guy at heart. I'm excited about where that goes. Very interested in, you know, other emerging technologies, AR, VR, crypto, all, you know, all of those sort of things. I stay in tune with that um, personally, but I generally don't introduce it professionally uh, until I, I see what's, what's working and what's not. Yeah, I, I, I was a bit skeptical at first, but I'll tell you, when I, when I watch my grandson uh, play video games with his buddies over the internet and they get the headset on and they're talking to one another, um, you know, this, this, this is definitely where it's headed. That generation is definitely going to be um, into the metaverse. Uh, Andrew, we, do, we have a question um, and, and the question is about purchasing targeted email lists. So that you know that cold outreach. If you purchase an email list and you, you use Mailchimp or one of those one of those services um, to reach out to that list, what what are your thoughts about that kind of cold outreach? Um, I mean, like everything, you have to consider the context of mm -hmm. the audience. But uh, take you know a wide range of audience um, professionals. They spend a lot of time on their computer every day, and they uh, they get a lot of emails. And if you've ever been one, uh, you are getting boatloads of these. And um, they're starting, I, I think, at the, at the uh, advent of these technologies, you had, um, you know, products like Grobots and these, you know, sort of AI-powered um, cold outreach programs. They were offering um, playbooks on how you might be able to capture the attention of the reader and uh, set up um, email campaigns that, you know, the first one goes out, says A, and then the next one goes out and says B, and the third one's a little more aggressive and tries to, you know, hey, are you still interested? And you start to notice those patterns as a recipient of those emails. Um, I, you know, I could basically name the playbook that was used for a dozen emails I receive a day from these programs and they immediately go in the trash. So I don't want to say that they're not effective, but I would, I would go as far as to say, if you're going to use them, um, don't bother using the playbook that the company has provided sort of, you know, don't use their template. The reason being is they're so detectable. Um, these tools are widely used now, and those templates are so widely used now that it is, you know, incredibly painful as a recipient of those emails <laughs> to have to deal with them. Um, cold outreach in general is a numbers game. So if you're playing a numbers game, make the numbers as big as possible. That would be my only other piece of advice. Uh, if you know you're going to have a point. 2% open rate, um, you know, just send millions. So <laughs> if I'm being serious on the tactical side, it is just numbers. So, you know, clearly there are people that will benefit from the services and products that, that a company is providing. But I, I really understand what you're saying. When I think about my own email that I receive every day, I would say 20% get deleted based on the subject line. Another 20% um, I open, but get deleted almost immediately based on the first one or two lines of the email. And, and then the remaining 50 to 60% are, are the emails that, that I'll actually read. And um, you know, it, it, knowing that what you're offering bring, does bring value, how do you, is, there a way to, is there a way to get through that? Is there a way to get to those people better than, than just a cold outreach? How, how do you accomplish that? Yeah, I mean, if you were to use the cold outreach approach, I would say uh, the most effective way to get it, um, to get a response is to offer something obscenely valuable that uh, requires basically nothing in return. Um, I'll use an example of one. I took the call. I did not actually engage in services with them, but I had like I had to hear what they had to say. And um, I, I, I was skeptical and I, I was ultimately uh, correct in my skepticism. But um, the curiosity is what made me accept this meeting. And the offer was um, we are going to offer you uh, industry specific leads. And you don't need to pay us unless you close a deal with them. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, that's too good to be true. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I've got to hear the, uh, 
the 15 minute pitch here. Like what, how could anyone even offer such a thing? And it turns out there were all these uh, caveats and I shouldn't have wasted my time anyway. But, um, but, you know, that is a testament to like, if you have something really, really, really valuable as a, uh, as a message and uh, you're not asking of much from them, you might have enough curiosity there that they would open it. But outside of that, um, you know, I, I just think there are there are really better channels for almost everything. Um, you know, advertising on the B2C side is very effective if you are connecting with searches that your customers are searching, if you're saying things that they're curious about, if you're offering promotions that they would benefit from. Um, you know, so th that's a channel that just is going to work better. And, and unfortunately, the the space is getting noisier and it's harder to break through. And uh, the only real way to break through is not some magic bullet, not some magic technology. It's uh, it's effort and refinement. Yeah, so so there's, there's a comment in the chat room that I, I wanna bring to everybody's attention. Um, basically points out that this can actually work against a company. If you're doing too much of this, you know, people will begin to look down on you um, as a company. I, I, I've been dealing with an interesting um, uh, promoter uh, over email recently. Over the last few months, I've been getting an email about every four or five days from somebody that, that is, would like to talk to me about marketing and marketing support for the tech council. And the email comes to me, it's got my name in it, but the, the, the text of the message always leads out with dear Jeff. And of course my name's not Jeff. <laughs> and and I, I, every time I see that, I, I, I get a kick out of it because this person probably does no idea that he's calling me by the wrong name. And, and, and that alone tells me that they're not sophisticated and I'll never respond to their email. Yeah, and that can leave a, a sour taste in your mouth. You know, um, they didn't even take the time to know my name. You know, why would I? Why would I want to have a conversation with them? And and not only that, now I'm 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 frustrated by them. I <laughs> I have a, a poor opinion of them. Um, so you know, if you're going to use those tools, uh, take advantage of. Um, most of them offer personalization and, and the ability to review what emails go out before they go out. You know, take the time to do it. If you're going to, uh, I, I realize it's a numbers game. So unfortunately, you know, that's, that becomes a lot of work reviewing all the emails that go out and say batches of 100 or 200. Um, but if you take the time to do it, uh, you might it, it, at least not damage your reputation in, in an example like this. Right. So, um, Andrew, we've run out of time, but uh, there is one one last question that I'd like to get in, and that is, what, what's what's the the best advice if you, if you could give one piece of, of advice to a CEO or a company founder? What what would that be? Well, that's a tough one. Um, I would say, and and do not quote me on this because it's not my quote. I believe it's actually Gino Wickman who wrote the book Traction, which is an excellent book, by the way. Um, live with it and it change it. I have that on a post-it note on my desk. Um, and, and it's just this idea that like, it, it, if something's not working or bothering you, you know, you, you do have a, you have a choice and you have a responsibility to address it. And you, one of those options is to live with it. And then, you know, that's on you. You've chosen to live with that. Um, but you have other options. You can change that or you can end that. Um, I, I, you know, you could use an, an employee as an example that it's, you know, things aren't working out. You can just keep button heads with them. Um, you can maybe change their role within your company and find something that they might fit better with and that you can, you know, work better with. Um, or say, end that relationship and, and find a, a replacement. Um, just one example of how that could be applied to really a lot of your decision-making factors as a, as a founder or CEO. Okay. So I just want to remind everybody that uh, you can find DuckPin on the internet at rollwithduckpin.com. Um, Andrew, are there other ways that people can reach out to get in touch with you if they want to make, make contact with DuckPin? Um, yeah, feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, follow our, our page on DuckPin. Um, just keep up with what we're doing and career opportunities, all that good stuff. If you want to share that with people, you know, um, that's about it. 
Great. Andrew, th thank you for your time this morning. Uh, I want to tell everyone that joined us, uh, th thank you for your time. Um, if you're interested in the Business Continuity Task Force, if you're facing challenges that you would like some assistance with, our mentors are very experienced executive mentors that would be happy to spend some time with you and, and uh, offer their insights. You can find the Business Continuity Task Force at our website, mdtechcouncil.com. Of course, you can find DuckPin at rollwithduckpin.com as well. And, and if you know others that would benefit from this conversation today, as I said earlier, this is, has been recorded and it will be available for, for watching or listening to um, in the next couple of days. Andrew, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Marty.